And we are live. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Friendship Podcast, man. We're here with David Green for Bigger Pockets, man. I'm super excited for this one. Real estate. Guys, we're talking about real estate, man. Let's get into it. Let's go. All right, guys, what's up, man? We're here to part two of the triple header that we got for y'all tonight, man. Uh, as you guys know, it's Money Monday, man. So we had Richard Hart earlier talking about cryptocurrency. We talked about a bunch of stuff on that. Now we got <coughs> bigger pockets in the house. Sorry, guys. For, for the losing my this is the real Money Monday. <laughs> two five episodes about money and finance. We got y'all, man. Yeah, man. Shout out to David Green in the house, man. Guys, yep. ju- check us out at patreon.com slash fresh shit, man. That's the only that's what we're going to make. Dave, can you introduce yourself to the people, man? We know who you are. We watch Bigger Pockets. We love the podcast. We love yep. y'all. But they may not know who you are. Can you introduce yourself real quick? That's always the worst question because it takes three hours to get everything out when you kind of do a little bit of everything. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm former law enforcement, started buying rental property. Um, I realized the direction that law enforcement was heading in was not a sustainable path to stay in. The relationship mm-hmm. between law enforcement and community was really rough in the Bay Area, California, where I was working so what pd did you work for uh i worked for the contra costa county sheriff's association and then i oh, got sure. laid off when uh we had the property taxes went really low from like the recession basically in 2010 uh, so i had to go find another department to work at because they were going to put me in court security and i was 27 years old had wow no yeah, you're like hell no do that. Yeah. yeah so the only department that was hiring was the public transit agency so i worked for the, the bart police department for oh. probably eight years or so and uh, started buying rental property for myself. Kind of learned how to do that. I got into the Burr method, which we can talk about. And Burr, where I my can, favorite. Yeah. yeah, scaled up to buying about four or five properties a month doing that. And then I got my real estate license. I started a real estate team with Keller Williams. This last year, I just started a mortgage company called the One Brokerage. That's exploding. We're probably the fastest growing mortgage company in the country right now. And uh, I got affiliated with Bigger Pockets hosting their podcast, where we just teach people how to invest in real estate. It's all free. It's like one of the few places out there you can learn how to invest in real estate without having to spend a hundred thousand dollars to have some guru teach you the game. <laughs> and uh, started writing books for them, and then that kind of just grew into being a little more. I, I guess influencer would probably be the word. I, I did a TED talk last year and i run a mastermind mastermind now and um little little things like that are kind of being added on hold on just real quick we gloss over what you said you said you used to buy four to five properties a month yeah four to five a month and and you did that as a police officer yes and oh. so how are you how are you met can you tell us a little bit about how, the- how you did that buying four to five properties a month as a police officer because i know with bart um i mean uh, with overtime everything you're probably bringing in about hundred thousand dollars a year um, you know, because people think, oh, police officers don't make any money. You could easily make six figures a year, guys. Yes, it's overtime. Yes, they consider it blood money, but you can definitely make quite a bit of money in law enforcement. But how are you doing that, man? All right, so the, there's the time element, like how you make time to actually do the due diligence by the properties. And, and then how'd the you get the capital? Element, right? Yeah, how'd you do both? Yeah. I started off just working more overtime than maybe anyone's ever worked. Mm. I would be working 15, 20 hour days, constantly seven days a week, all the time. I knew like, what I notice most people when they don't like their job is they work less hard. Right? Yeah. I hate this job, so I'm just going to phone it in. And when they when a, when the boss gives me a raise, then I'll try hard. Life does not honor that. No one's going to come along and like the coach isn't going to put you in the game because you've been lazy. And maybe if I give him some playing time, he'll play hard. You, know, mm. you got to go Facts. earn what you're looking for. Right. So I knew if I want to get out of this, I'm just going to have to build enough income from real estate that I could make the jump into something else. So. I would work a lot. I saved all my money. I rented a room from other cops. I never bought a house for myself. I had probably nine rental properties before. Not married, right? One. Nope, not married. Nice. No kids. <laughs> Smart move. A lot of the guys that would kind of watch what I was doing, they uh, they would ask like, how do you do it? And I'm like, I don't know that you can do it. You got T-ball to go to. You have yeah. a wife to keep happy. Like I didn't have to do anything other than accomplish that goal. So yeah. smooth. Save the money. And, and I would maybe buy like a property or two every year because you got to put uh, on the properties at the time like sixty, seventy thousand dollars down on every single property. So mm. th- that was killing me. 
And I realized this is not. So you're doing two. You were doing two a year in the beginning. Yes. So you're putting 50, 60 k down because you're working crazy overtime. What were you making uh, back then? No, this we is... had a good setup there in the Bay Area. Yeah. So I would say I was making uh, probably like in the hundred to two hundred thousand dollar range. Okay. And the best year ever. I worked seven days a week, twenty hour days. I slept in my car almost the whole year. Bam. That year I made about three hundred thousand dollars. Wow. But notice the sacrifice that he yeah. gave up. To yeah, that money. Yeah. yeah, my health took a hit. I'm still trying to recover from that. Your social life takes a hit. Your relationships say, I just realized you can't run at a dead sprint your whole life. You no, have you can't. to hit a, a pace that can be measured. That's where I learned the Burr method. Yeah. So what I realized that explains is, me and you both having fucked up sleep schedules because me and Dave were like texting back and forth and like we're like <laughs> we're both night owls and shit because I used to work in law enforcement too. So uh, no, his no, schedule is all screwed up, bro. Yeah, mine he is fucked up during too. the day. I'm like, bro, wake up. Yeah, <laughs> my shit is fucked up, man. <laughs> but um, so okay, so you so you you busted your ass. You were copping two houses a year, pretty much, uh, putting fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars down. Was that twenty percent back then? Yeah, probably. percent. Okay. Mm. Um, and then and then you got to a point where you're able to scale up where you buy four to five houses a, a month. How did you do that? That was the Burr method. It stands for buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. And it's not as complicated as what people want to make it sound like. The yeah. problem when you're trying to buy a lot of real estate is you go put a lot of money as a down payment. Yeah. Then you go dump a lot of money into fixing it up. And you have equity in the property. It is worth more than what you owe on the loan. But that equity is stuck in the house. You can't go use it to buy your next house. So yeah. it gives this, in my opinion, a false illusion of safety. People think that, oh, I have $200,000 of equity in that house. I'm okay if the market corrects. And it's just I don't think that's a good way to look at it. Because when the market corrects, there's nothing you do to stop your equity from dropping. You have no control over equity in an actual property. And furthermore, it doesn't matter if you don't have equity in a property because it not only matters if you're going to sell it. If the market drops, you shouldn't sell your house. If it's cash flowing, you just keep it and you wait for the market to turn around. So what I realized is that instead of continuing to buy properties and spend a lot of money to fix them up, I would do that. And then they were worth significantly more than I had paid for them when it was done. I would refinance it afterwards. Mm. I could recover almost all the capital, sometimes more capital than I put in the deal. Now I got that money back. I can go buy the next house. That helped me in several ways. For one, obviously having your capital back, you can go buy another property. That's how I got to four or five. While still maintaining that property that you have. Yep. Yeah. And you're only pulling out 80% of the equity. So you're left with a healthy amount, 20% of equity, the property cash flows. You keep the house. It's kind of like flipping, but instead of selling it, you keep it as a rental. Yeah. And the other thing it allowed you to do is it actually lets you get the reps in. That's another thing people don't think about. You want to be good at anything in life. You have to do it a lot. Yeah. Anyone who's successful, you're not. There's no martial artist that got really good at something not doing it all the time. There's no one who works out that is in really good shape without doing it all the time. You can't get good at investing in real estate, managing money, anything that your listeners like, unless you get a lot of repetition. But you can't get a lot of repetition. You got to put eighty thousand dollars down on a new property. Not, people don't have enough money to do that. Yeah. Right. So the Burr method allowed me to get these reps in. I got better contractors. I got better at what I was doing. The agents would bring me the deals first. I had the confidence to move forward quickly because I analyzed them a lot more than the person who might need three or four days to figure out what they were going to do. Um, I started to be the person who was like buying the majority of the best deals in that market. And that was how I grew the portfolio. Nice. So, so you start out. So the first, so the first year I'm guessing, or first two years, you're buying like one to two houses a year, yeah. putting down heavy down payments. You're working, you know, crazy hours to get the capital to be able to do it. And then later, then later on, you're like, you know what? There's gotta be easy, easier way. You go ahead, you start doing the Burr method. And at this point you're able to buy a house, snowball that in refinance take that money out tax-free of course by yep. the way and then go ahead and get another house and you were doing this three to four times a month that's it because because wow. about the prices maybe in 2013 14 or so yeah i was buying in mostly northern florida a little bit in arkansas a little bit in arizona oh so you were buying i was buying out of state you you weren't buying in california no that's smart. okay no. That's <laughs> now how. this makes a lot more yeah. sense i'm making california money but i'm investing it into areas where the properties are much cheaper and i'm kind of able to bully around some of the local buyers yeah to them they think that's a lot of money yeah right mm -hmm. they don't have the cash but your average deal you i could buy a fixer upper trash house good bones but look terrible sits on the market a long time for sixty thousand dollars i just go pay cash yeah because i don't need it that's not a down pay anymore i've kept it then I spent thirty thousand to fix it up, so I've spent about ninety thousand dollars on this house. Mm -hmm. It'll the appraisal will come in around one hundred and twenty. The bank's going to let me borrow seventy five to eighty percent of the one hundred and twenty, which is about the ninety I put in. Mm -hmm. So I'm putting ninety thousand dollars out, and then I, in a couple months, when the rehab's done, ninety thousand is coming back in. Now I'm saving up more money. I have a couple of those ninety thousand dollars that I'm sending out, and you start to get a cycle going in where money's coming out, and then it's coming back in in a couple months, and in the meantime, more money's going out on the next house. Yeah. Now for the people out there that are scared to, you know, because because I'm, I'm in a situation now where I'm actually looking at a deal right now in Texas, million dollars, 
hotel. Um, it, you know, I'm going to probably have to put two on, and we could talk about the mortgage stuff on the side as well, since you have your mortgage company, you know, 20 to 25%. Um, I'm under contract right now for two properties. So my capital is tied up right now on these two deals. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, I get, I, I got eight properties. I can go ahead and do a cash out refinance on. So my thing is I have not done a cash out refinance yet. Okay. And for a lot of people, they're like, they get worried. Like, fuck, if I do a cash out refinance, it's going to mess up my cash flow. Am I going to still be able to go ahead and pull that equity out while simultaneously being able to get money? And, you know, the interest rates have went up or whatever. So what are your thoughts on people that um, have reservations about doing cash out refinances since you've done them so much? Well, let's talk about some of the common objections you're going to yeah, hear, right? Please. If you over leverage, like immediately when someone hears cash out refinance, they hear over leverage. You're going to be borrowing too much, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't matter what you owe on a property. You can have a property worth $100,000 and you could theoretically owe $150,000. Mm -hmm. If it makes you $1,000 a month, it's not a risky move. Yeah. You could conversely be the other way around. You could have a property worth a million. You only owe 200,000, but if you're bleeding a thousand dollars a month on it, that could hurt you. Yeah. So the wrong metric to look at is the percentage of equity you have in the house. The better metric to look at is, is it performing well? Is it cash flowing? Mm. So I, I just did a cash out refinance on like the first four properties I bought in California. Okay. Waited about probably eight years or so. Damn. Pulled over seven figures out of those four deals. Wow. Like you said, was you did free. them all. You did them all in one one cash out refinance yeah. package. Yeah, that's one of the the benefits of our our loan brokerage is these guys that work for me. They work on my own deals, so mm -hmm. now they can help the people like you trying to do the same thing that I'm doing, and they've been kind of trained in how to do that right. So wow. pull all the money out at one time out of these four, and my interest rate did go up. I was at like a three point seven five. I think I ended up with like a five and a half or a six percent. No one likes that. Okay. Yeah. But the difference of the two percent that my rate went up is s significantly less than the return I got on the new properties I bought. And it's, it's how you're looking at it, right? When you come from that, it's overused, but the scarcity mindset phrase of, I have an interest rate of 4%, I don't want to go up to 6%. You're going to lose 2% on that. But are you only going to get a less than a 2% return on what you buy? Mm -hmm. If what I'm buying is getting a 10 to 12% return, it's, it's, worth worth it. It. it's totally worth it, yeah, right? Yeah. And that's only the cash flow element. That's not considering that now, you know, I, I'm buying million dollar properties and, and my tenants are going to be paying those off and the rents are going to go up every single year. That 10% return turns into a 20% return in a couple of years. So it's it's how you look at uh, the pros and the cons and how you mitigate the risk that's always going to be present when you're investing in anything, including real estate. So that's fantastic. Your company, you guys do cash out refis, you guys give loans, everything. Yep. That's awesome. Damn, okay. I'm going to you, bro. Yeah, I'm going, I'm, I'm about to, <laughs> especially for this deal that I got going, that I'm looking Some at right now in Texas. Because, uh, um, oh, other thing I was going to say, what made you say Arkansas and Florida? I know the cost is obviously a good one, but you were buying these properties up, what, in the early 2010s at that time probably i'd say 2010 to 2018 is when i was doing that what, what you're looking for is what we call the one percent rule so there's ah. this metric that if a property rents for one percent of what you paid for it it is statistically very likely to cash flow and it's worth looking into can you give right. the people an example real quick yeah, numerically absolutely. so let's say you buy a hundred thousand dollar house one yep. percent of that is a thousand dollars if a it month. rents for a thousand dollars a month it's worth looking into it's probably going to make money mm -hmm. and then it kind of scales from there four hundred thousand dollar house if it's anywhere close to four grand a month it's probably going to cash flow so I couldn't do this in California because the price to rent oh, ratios were way too way high. Too high. Yeah. Exactly. You're not going to make a lot of money with cash flowing properties. Right? You make money there in equity. It's a different way. But I could do that in the South. So I would find a market that had 1% properties, Arkansas, Florida, Arizona, lots of, lots of places in, in the Southeast. And then I would look for which of those areas have the most fixer uppers. Mm. And then I would say, how do I build a team there? That The first book I wrote was Long Distance Real Estate Investing. And mm. I call it the core four. I'd, I need a contractor, an agent, a lender, and a property manager. If I have those four people, everything that I need, I can get it done inside that market. Nice. So then I would just like keep buying. And one contractor doesn't work out, I get a better one. Property manager is cool. But then this agent over here has a better property manager. Your team slowly gets better like through the draft. Every year you're drafting in new people. Wow. Bam. Damn, smart. All right. Um, okay. So we got uh, Moises Main. Maine. 110 bo bucks goes. Uh, shout out David Green, uh, 24, and Rich, uh, the lender, for always dropping gems on the gram. Let's go at the one brokerage. brokerage. Awesome. 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 Uh, I, I might be doing business with y'all soon, man, because like I said, I got this deal in Texas that I'm looking at. Um, you do it, my favorite RH quote. Uh, no, 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 that's from before, Chris. No, Jeez. but we... Um, Missed that. Oh, oh we missed them? Yep. 200 bucks. Okay, thank you so much. Right. That's your card. Thank Down you so much. Right. And then we got uh, 10 thoughts. bucks from Last Thoughts goes, question, Zillow, do you subtract monthly costs from the rent estimate to calculate the cash flow? Uh, I, example goes 1750 rent, 1300 equal negative cash flow property, or 1300 monthly expense minus rent, 1750 equal ca positive cash flow. 
I'm trying, confused trying here. to understand this question. Yeah, I'm trying to understand He's the question too, bro. From rent. So monthly cost of the um, property from rent. You would take the rent and subtract the expenses if that's if he's he had almost asked looks like he's asking yeah which I think he's to go. okay yeah so you got to figure out how much money the property makes right now off of the tenants in there and then you go ahead and you calculate what the mortgages are going to be taxes insurance all that other stuff subtract that and then whatever you have left over hopefully should be your cash flow and if it doesn't cash flow just say it. no yeah. don't buy it don't do buy not it. buy it uh, Batman five bucks love these money Mondays what can the average guy who makes 30 40k a year do aside from mm. pushing up to make more money to get into real estate it's tough the first thing i would say to that question is let real estate be your carrot that that helps you get over the hump mm. right like there's a lot of people that will say oh you don't have any money you don't have any credit you don't have anything going for you in life real estate's the magic pill that's going to save you it's a dangerous asset class to get into if you aren't already good with money yeah things pop Agreed. up with real estate that you yeah. cannot have anticipated you need to have a bit of a poor. buffer absolutely yeah how about so, to me i don't i don't think that real estate is a good way to make your money it is a good way to grow money that you've already made. That's just my opinion. There's lots of people who look at it differently. So if you're only making 30, 40,000 a year and you want to buy a house, that should drive you to go find ways to make more money. Yeah. If you're driven enough to be listening to something like this and looking into real estate, you can make more than $30,000. Absolutely. You can. Absolutely. You everybody can. Everybody who doesn't have money at work, they all talk like, well, how do you get a good job? And it's so hard out there. And everyone I know that owns a business, all we do is look for people that will be good workers. Yeah. <laughs> like it's that's it's this weird dynamic that you see. Yeah. No, it's, that's it's a mindset, point, man. man. Um, okay. Uh, 100 bucks shout out, one brokerage, David Green's lending company, love FNF and DG. Keep killing it. Thank you so much, Mike. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Don't and that's Marco, Ricardo Gorilla. Gorilla. Uh, ten bucks. Uh, shout out to the hard work y'all do. If only people would listen to y'all's advice versus uh, taking what they see from clips. Follow Rod Eric and Cornerstone TX. We take in over FNF Dallas. Yes, the property I'm looking at is in Dallas. So yeah. Don't do Marco, and then we got uh, Christian uh, Batch uh, Batch Bachelor Batch Elder. Sorry. All right. I see Ricky. Let's get it. Okay. Shout out to Christian. Shout out to you, Christian. And then the last two here, guys, from this point forward, we're only going to read uh, 20, 50 and up, yeah. uh, okay, because we got a lot of sauce to go through on this on this conversation. It goes to Paul and right now. Um, JMC436 goes, shout out to the OG David Green. Him and Brandon Turner are the best in the real estate podcast game. You know what? Yes, I will probably have to agree with that. Uh, I, I listen to Bigger Pockets myself. I'm really excited about that, which I'm, I'm going to actually ask about Brandon here in a second. <laughs> yeah. uh, Moises Main goes, uh, shout out to David Green. Oh, read that one, I think. Yep, yeah, read yeah, that one right. earlier. Um, so, uh, so we talked about cash out refinances, ma make it happen. Okay. Brandon Turner, where's he at, man? He's in Hawaii chilling or what? Brandon is kind of traveling the whole world right now. So okay. he's left Hawaii for the first time. He's been in Arizona. He's been, he's bought a place in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. He's been hanging out quite a bit there. Nice. Uh, and he does the family thing like mm. that. He's probably the best dad I've ever seen in my entire mm. life. Wow. And for the people that are wondering, that's the guy in bigger pockets with the big beard. And it's funny cause <laughs> yeah. now he has the freedom. And the money to do whatever he wants to do. That's his whole like. That's sort of where the bigger pockets of ethos. A lot of it came from Brandon Turner saying, yeah. "Look, you you make money, you build wealth to live life on your terms and for freedom, not necessarily to make up for insecurities that you have or to fuel your ego." Um, if you start off that way and that's what motivates you, at some point you'll probably lose your way. But Brandon's someone who's been very successful and has never changed a bit because he knew what he was doing it for. And it's funny because each person in bigger pockets has their own way of doing things. Like, for example, Scott Trench, yep. his book, Set for Life, helped me because a young guy coming up, how do you make it? You, you're, you're, you for example, old guy that's, that's on his way up, wants to find a way of freedom, you follow your pattern. Sir. It's good. So, um, for you, man. So can you tell the people a little bit about your uh, real estate portfolio? Because you're doing things on a crazy scale Numbers. right now. Um, yeah. As far as like, how are you procuring properties? What's your portfolio like? How many doors? How many properties, etc.? Yeah. So the last six, seven years, it's been very hard to get into real estate. If you got in, you did well. Yeah. But that's kind of the way life works. It's either easy on the front end. And yep. then it's hard on the back end or it's hard on the front end. It's going to be easy in the back end. There's no way around that. Yeah. So we interest rates were low. There's a lack of supply. The government has printed so much insane money. I don't know if you guys have had guests on to talk about that. We have. No, we have. It needs to be talked about more. No, 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 please. So we, we can talk about the inflation rates as well. We'll talk about that here in a second. Yeah. So it, it makes you guys like me look really smart because inflation is just this huge wave that's carrying me. Right. You can never swim as fast as this wave will push you through in the ocean. And so uh, it was very difficult to buy real estate. Well, when rates went up, people don't realize that real estate is just like cryptocurrency and stocks. It's more psychological than people want to admit. Like there's a collective psychology of the whole buyer pool of any asset class. And they tend to operate like a flock of birds. They all go the same direction at the same time. Uh, everybody's making money in something. Let's go buy a lot of it. Yeah. Nobody's buying. Okay, let me get out. Right. I almost always look to be counter to that. 
So when the yeah. market was red hot, I was still buying, but I didn't put as much of my attention into buying real estate because the return on my time would be less. There's so many people competing for that same thing. Uh, I spent more time building the companies, building the the real estate team, building the mortgage company, building the mastermind. And now that interest rates have gone up and everyone's talked about this crash that they think is going to come, a lot of buyers have got cold, cold feet. So <laughs> I'm jumping in and buying a whole lot more real estate yep, right now, yep, right? Yep. And the key is I'm buying the stuff that normal, like the best stuff that you wouldn't have been able to even get at all. Like mm. it, it would have got scooped up right away, right? I'm not chasing after the lower level properties, like home starter homes that everybody wants. Like you could buy those anytime. I'm going after the luxury stuff that's really nice. You can add a lot of equity. It's going to perform really well over a significant period of time. So is that A-class properties? In general, yeah. B I'd plus, say A-class B, or even sometimes above A-class. Like you get into like multi-million dollar, like, like, uh, really? A, yeah. Like short-term rental, luxury short-term rentals. That's even so, more than A-class. So question for you, Dave, because we had a conversation with uh, Ken McElroy uh, a couple, uh, like, well, um, I think a month ago. A month ago. He was here with Robert, Robert Kiyosaki and, and, um, and George Gammon. And he was saying that he specifically tries to stay away from A-classes because um, you know, they're expensive and, you know, with the recession coming, you know, people are going to leave those A classes and go into B and C classes. You know, the biggest thing he was looking for was, um, schools, right? Mm -hmm. Like good schools is where he would buy in the B class level. Um, but you're doing something a little bit different. I mean, I, I haven't heard someone go, um, purchasing A class type uh, properties. Can you tell us a little bit about like your reasoning for doing that? And, uh, the, the. I guess the mindset for it. Yeah. Well, Ken's also referring to multifamily. Yeah. That's what he buys. It, okay. So, yeah. A class multifamily would be different than A class residential properties. Okay. Gotcha. Right. He's looking at A class multifamily is the most expensive apartment you could get, like over the top luxury type mm -hmm. of stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. When times get tough, people are going to drop down to something more affordable. That's mm -hmm. true. Yeah. What I'm talking about are oh. vacation rental properties, stuff in the best neighborhood, on the water, the most incredible view. If you could take your pick of where you're going to go vacation, that's the one you're going to pick, mm. right? It's actually a much more solid asset class to get into. And if you do see uh, demand go down, the people at the bottom in, in the short-term rental space, they're the ones that are going to get hit. No one wants to go to your cookie cutter house, with like track home, condo. There's a million of them. They want to go somewhere extra nice. And when demand goes down, they're all going to be like, what's the best place I can possibly get? Right. They can also, I can charge less per night and be okay. Whereas if you're only charging $100 a night, you have the budget option. How much more can you drop it when there's a thousand other people also charging the same. dollars Yeah. So when, when it's a market like this where we don't know, is it going to come down more? Is it solid? You never know. I want something different and unique that will hold its value for a long period of time. Not a track home. Big, unique lot. More space. Better views. Uh, more square footage on the house, best neighborhood around, right? So like I bought a property in Malibu. I bought a property in Scottsdale, three and a half million dollars. That one's awesome. I'm going to be heading there actually. S tomorrow. Single family home. Yep. Okay. Single family home on five acres, but it's 6,800 square feet. It's going to rent for $2,000 a night. I'm able to use that to host retreats. Uh, We're putting something like that together right now. Are, so are you just like Airbnb in it to people? Yep, like, okay, it. gotcha, gotcha. So you're, you're getting these a, okay, now it makes sense. Yeah. You're getting the A class properties, but you're Airbnb in them. You're not putting long term tenants in them. No, that's exactly right. Mm. I, this is the first time I've done the Airbnb thing. Before it was long term tenants. Gotcha. Right? So that's I think where the confusion came. Okay. Your your logic would be correct if it was for long term tenants because they wouldn't cash flow if you're trying to buy A class yeah. properties. Right. Okay. Okay. I, I mean, now with with that said, are, have you ever been um, worried as far as like with the recession coming, people aren't going to take as many vacations, or people aren't going to want to spend that kind of money uh, on a on a vacation? You know, um, granted, you got in really good areas, Scottsdale mm -hmm. and Malibu, right? These are pl places that people are going to want to go, yeah. um, and you can demand those kind of prices. But has that ever come up, or oh, is it always. like, yeah? No, I think about that constantly. Like, okay. I'm word law enforcement. We yeah. look at like what could go wrong <laughs> yeah, all the yeah. time. You can't yeah. help it, right? Yeah. So uh, in order to combat that, it doesn't mean I don't buy. It just means I'm going to put more money in reserve to weather the storm. Right? Okay. Gotcha. I just save more money than the average person does. I still live beneath my my means. I live a very modest lifestyle. Same. Because <laughs> if I do that, I feel more comfortable to take risks. Uh, Damn. Right? And, and at a certain point when I don't need to take risks anymore, I'll live a nicer lifestyle if that's what I want to do. But in the meantime, it's more important that I shut down that little drunk monkey in your brain that yeah. says, what if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? Put enough money in the bank doesn't matter what happens. doesn't matter. You got plenty of reserves. So, so, um, so your transit, I guess. So when you first started where you, you were doing the burr method, right? You're yeah. procuring a bunch of properties doing that. Um, with the cash out refis and everything else like that. I'm assuming you probably had long, longer term tenants in there, like regular yes. tenants. And then what made you say, you know what, man, I'm going to transition. I'm going to get into the Airbnb game because that's kind of something where I've, 
I'm, I dabbled with it a little bit. I got a tenant right now that's mm -hmm. on the master's lease that's, uh, you know, Airbnb in it. And I'm doing the math in my head. I'm like, I know this guy's making a good amount of money on Airbnbs. You know, I've been reluctant on it because I'm like, ah, it's riskier. People fuck up your property, whatever it may be. But with you, you got A properties, which I could see what you did there because those people are less likely to fuck up your place. Yes. And they're going to still be spending a lot of money. What made you make that transition? Like, you know what? I'm going to take the risk. I'm going to start doing Airbnbs. The honest answer is I wanted to, I saw the, the softening in the market and now's a chance to get into the best locations, the best areas. And the oh. only way you make a cash flow is Airbnb. Yeah. Mm. It's not going to cash. It's too far off of the 1% rule to actually get a long-term tenant. So my only option was continue to buy basic properties where I don't know how much they'll be affected by a market crash mm -hmm. or take advantage and get the best deals I possibly can. But if I'm going to do that, I have to go short-term rentals. Right. So what I've done to sort of like offset it is I bought a lot of them in the Smoky Mountains where I have a property manager that's going to take care of everything. It might as well be a long-term. I'm not going to have to deal with any of that. So I just bought 10 cabins out there, probably spent around like $12 million over those 10 cabins. They're like really nice stuff. Like Holy shit. And that, those are going to be Airbnbs. Yep. That's okay. it. So people go visit in Tennessee. Like that whole area is very, very popular. But I didn't go buy the same, like I didn't go buy the $500,000 cabin where there's a million of them. Mm -hmm. Right. It was something very different and unique that would draw more people to this cabin. Okay. And then I bought more square footage and I put more beds in them. So you can maybe take 10, 15, 20 people on this trip. Now everybody only has to kick in a hundred bucks. Right. Right. So this is still affordable because they're big. If I tried to buy a luxury property, but it was very small and only four people could Wouldn't stay make sense. there. Yeah. That's when you're exposed to what you're describing. Like what happens if people stop visiting? What's yeah. the length of stay? I'm not sure if you know this, but the length of stay people will stay in your Airbnbs. Like how long would they normally stay? You know, more, usually it's like three to six days six or days. so. But you every once in a while will get somebody uh, stay for like a month and they'll pay you 15 grand. Because I saw an article wow. where there's a bunch of young people that are making a lot of money and they just travel from place to place to stay yep. Airbnbs for like a long period of time and then just move to the next city. That's exactly, that's the trend I think is going to happen. As yeah. People can use the internet more. They don't have to work from an office space anymore. They're going to want to go to the best area. They're going to always be afraid to buy real estate. There's always the next fear of the next problem that's going to happen. They're not going to get involved. So they're going to want to rent. And so it's just taking advantage of that by you own the real estate. They pay you to stay there. As it, long as you keep enough money in reserves, like real estate will always do well. It's a new way of being a, a nomad, basically a digital yeah. nomad. You just get on a computer, you go to a nice luxury spot, you stay at when you get bored of it, you move to the next city, do the same thing. Yeah. No, I mean, that's 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 a incredibly interesting that you – so yeah. did you see basically like a weak point in the market right now with the fact that like – because let, let's be honest, a year ago, right? Like I, I got seven properties last year, but man, it was a pain in the ass. I was losing deals to New Yorkers all over the place, paying cash, being assholes. Yeah. And um, it was a very hot real estate market. So now that the market's dipped quite a bit, right, with um, interest rates going up, et cetera, um, you know, the first thing that's going to take a hit a little bit are these, you know, A-class properties. That's so you're it. like, you know what? This is my ability to get in. Maybe a $2 million property, I'm able to snag it for maybe a 1.6, 1.5, 1.7, somewhere in that range. Is that what made you say this is the perfect time to strike because interest rates went up less affordable, which means I'm competing with less people? Yep. You always, or at least I always want to be going the opposite of where everyone else goes. The Bam. Warren Buffett. You want to be greedy when others are fearful, fearful when others are greedy. Yeah. So when rates go up, that means that the price of the, the payment is going to go up too. Most people get scared and they immediately think, let me buy the cheapest property I possibly can because mm -hmm. it's going to have the lowest payment. But those are the ones that are most exposed to market corrections. If you look at the areas that got smashed in 2010, it wasn't Beverly Hills. It was going to be Detroit, mm -hmm. right? It, it, the yeah. lowest price stuff is what <laughs> Stockton, California, Modesto, where I'm from, got hammered. The nicer areas, Walnut Creek, didn't really get touched. Wow. You also see that uh, the more expensive a property is, the more sensitive that the monthly payment's going to be to interest rate hikes. Yep. So on a $300,000 house, rates could double. Your payment goes up a couple hundred dollars. Yep. Rates double on a $2 million house, that could be $6,000. It's a significant difference. At the same time, higher price point, people don't have to buy real estate. No one has to buy a two, three, four million dollar $4 house. You probably got to buy something if you're buying in the $300,000 range. Yeah. So what I was looking to do is I'm trying to get into a market where other people are not going after those homes. They're sitting on the market a long time. People that are looking at, it depends what market you're you in. You can but. aggressively uh, make an offer if it's been on the market for 30, 60 days. Hey, you're, you're not selling this thing, man. It's fucking $2 million. I'll take it off your hands for 1.5. That is exactly right. So one of them in uh, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, listed at 1.5, sat for a long time. He drops it to 1.4, 1.3, 1.25. 1 I go see it at 1.2. And this was the day that Jerome Powell came out and said, everybody shouldn't buy houses. 
So just stop buying, right? <laughs> Perfect. Bitcoin crashed the same day. Right? I watch the Perfect. news a lot because I want to know what everybody else is, is hearing. Yeah. Right? Because most people, like, they're a flock of birds. Everyone's going that way. I should go that way, yep. too. So I wrote an offer on that house at one million fifty thousand. Okay. Asked for thirty thousand dollars closing cost credit. He's listed at one point two. He comes back and he goes, "I'll take it, but I don't want to pay the credit." And so normally I'd have been like, "Oh heck yeah, I'll I'll take that." But in this case, I didn't, just mm. because I knew like there's no way this guy's dropped his house from one point five. He's willing to take a million fifty. He's not going to blow up a deal over thirty thousand dollars. Yep. Sure enough, next day we didn't even have to counter. He just came back and said, "Okay, I'll take the deal." Had the news not been what it was, had you hadn't been hearing everybody saying, oh, this guy is falling, everything's terrible, that house doesn't sell for less than the 1.5. But yeah. the seller's under all of this strain and fear and psychological torment. He's trying to move on with this life. He's thinking about what am I going to do next? The house is sitting there for 70 days. You have a big opportunity. You don't get to do the same thing chasing after a $400,000 house that's been on the market for six days. Wow. A grandma once said, when I watch the news, I don't watch it for news. I watch to decide what to do next. There you go. <laughs> yeah, man. That I mean, me, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, no, I mean, that's that's fantastic because like normally people would be scared to do a deal that big, right? But the yeah. fact that you're doing short-term rentals, you know, Airbnb, et cetera, you're able to really leverage that property and make quite a bit of money on it. Whereas like with long-term rental, you never would. And like, you know, and I'll say this because, you're, you know, you're obviously doing these bigger deals like me, right? I'm over here trying to buy a 400, 500,000, 600, 700,000 dollar house, right? Or a duplex, triplex, whatever. Well, I'm competing with all the other retards. That's the right? problem. And I'm losing deals. And I, I was looking at a couple of deals in Connecticut. I, I'll never forget last year, I lost so many deals to cash buyers from New York, bro. It's ridiculous. But that's what happens when you, you know, buy at that level where people can, uh, more people can kind of come in and invest. But when you go the higher up you go like that, when you're buying million plus dollar properties, there's not going to be much competition. So they're forced to give you a $30,000 credit. That's wow. exactly right. And that's Twitch, by the way. So uh, what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, yeah, kill Twitch. Word, yeah. yeah, whatever. Fuck it. Yeah, <laughs> kill, kill the Twitch stream and kill the Twitter stream. Come on over to YouTube, guys. Uh, yeah. Teaching you guys. That. Man, this is a great Money Monday, by the way, guys. We talked about crypto first. Now we're talking about real estate. So two things that could change your life, guys. Absolutely. Yep. Um. So, Dave, real quick. Market crash. Do you think it's coming? Not. What's your thoughts on that? I see some people going crazy. Oh, the market is going to crash. Okay. <laughs> The future of real estate. Yes. First thing I want to say in general, almost every time there's controversy over something, no one bothers <laughs> to define the terms they're arguing over. Bam. Have you guys picked that no, notice this? It's it's becoming like a big thing in my life where I, I'm taking a lot of heat for saying that the market's not going to crash. And they're like, well, no, he's buying all these houses. He was lying. I was like, no, this is not a crash. This is a correction. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, yep. You have to understand supply and demand. A crash, I don't see coming. Now that doesn't Agreed. mean it can't happen. I agree. Right? China goes forward with Taiwan. That could change some things, right? Mm -hmm. But from what we're seeing right now, there is not enough supply out there right now to Thank allow you. a crash to happen, okay? Mm. So what happens is if prices start coming down before they hit crash levels, they become so affordable that Myron can buy a bunch of them and I can buy a bunch of them. And then we're going to go raise money from other people we know that have money but don't know how to invest in real estate. We're going to buy all of them. It's, it's like trying to hold a beach ball underwater. You're, you're never going to push it all the way to the bottom. It's going to come up, back up at some point. That doesn't mean prices can't come down. Right. What, what I was talking about earlier is the houses I'm buying right now are in areas where I think are extra susceptible to coming down. Yeah. I think that when rates come back down at a certain point, those prices are going to go back up. And on some of these houses, I make half a million dollars in equity pretty quick just from the rates coming down and the asset changing. So, no, I don't think we have a crash. Yes, I think that we're having a correction and yes. I think we've needed this. It's not healthy that a house goes on the market and in two days has 10 offers yeah. and sells for $200,000 over asking. Yes. This is, thank God this is finally happening. It's yeah, fuck these, these sellers, dude. <laughs> Like I was pissed. Like these sellers really had like some crazy gall. Like, oh no, I'm you. You you make an offer cash. Oh no, well I have a, another offer, twenty thousand dollars over cash. Fuck you, or they don't answer no calls or whatever. No appraisal. I used to say it's like being a girl in Alaska. <laughs> she can have whatever she wants. Right? Like, that's how it's been in real estate. There's ten yeah. buyers for every property. Yeah, no, it was bad, dude. It was it was bad <laughs> last year when I was like uh, I was getting in like bidding wars and all that. Then I realized like I'm not gonna fucking overpay for this thing. This is stupid. So, um, but no, I agree with you, man. We're five and a half million homes short. I don't know why people keep saying that we're gonna have a market crash. They're fucking stupid. They don't understand the concept of supply and demand. Mm -hmm. Um, so do you not buy store homes anymore? You mentioned earlier that you know the three twos is what everyone is going after. Is that what you're not you're not focused on those anymore right I, now? I wouldn't say I wouldn't buy one, okay. but I'm not targeting them. Right. right? Like gotcha. if, it, if it falls in front of me, I'm gonna take it down. Right. Mm -hmm. But I'm not hunting for those right now. Gotcha. So gotcha. let's say I'm an average viewer on the show. I'm an average Joe making let's say. 40 to 60k a year i want to get into real estate mm -hmm. i know you kind of answered it earlier but like 
what should my main method be to get into start getting into real estate? It's called house hacking. You familiar with that phrase? That's what I did. House hacking is every single person here should do that. You should house hack one house every year. And before you do a burr, before you invest long distance, before you do anything else, mm. that needs to be your second house that year. And here's why. You can get a primary residence loan for anywhere between three and a half to 5%. FHA. Now. Yeah. So you can actually buy a house if you're doing FHA loan or a conventional loan. Our, our company does them all the time. So you reach out to us. We get you pre-approved. Mm. You have $15,000. You can buy a $300,000 house. Okay. Then you either look for a multifamily property or a property with an ADU. Or what I like to do What's is- What's an ADU? Uh, that would be the term that we use for uh, accessory dwelling unit. You might call it like an in-law unit, a granny unit, okay. or a haunted uh, unit. They're, it's like an additional- building on building property. on property yeah. okay yeah. so what i'm doing out here I, I just bought a couple of properties in fort lauderdale well there there's not a lot of properties in that area that have two car garages some mm -hmm. of them don't have garages at all so what i'll do is i'll go look for that really nice house that's going to be a great vacation rental mm -hmm. then i'll find one that has a two car garage i will finish that and turn it into its own one bedroom or studio apartment that will rent individually from the other house nice so it's maybe going to be $45,000 to convert that thing into its own unit. That will rent out as kind of like a budget option for someone that wants to come visit the beach and doesn't want to pay as much money. Then the main house where the backyard and everything else is included will rent out separately from that. And maybe I increase my revenue by like 30% by looking for something. Anyone can do that. If you're just a little creative, you get put a little bit of elbow grease in a deal. You look for a house with a basement that isn't finished. Like I, I just put mm. one under contract in Castro Valley, California, very hard area to get into incredibly good school districts. This was something the last five years, you just weren't going to get a house there too. Mm. And there was, as soon as it hit the market, someone was buying it right away for yeah. cash and $300,000 over. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Like really. What the fuck? So this specific house was only like 1100 square feet, one bathroom. It sat there forever because the market cooled off and like, it's not a soup. The floor plan was kind of messed up, mm -hmm. but it's sitting on a raised foundation, huge space. Like I'm going to double the floor plan by just going in and finishing out that basement that's already there. So then mm. when that house is done, I'm now going to have double the square footage. Sheesh. The after repair value is going to be much higher. I'm going to do a burr. I'm going to pull the money back out of it, reinvest that in the next deal. That would have been a perfect house hack for somebody. And it's, and is the house going to still, you think, cash flow or break even? Oh, it's going to cash flow amazingly on that one. Even, it, what, even after the cash out refi? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I'm basically, it's one unit right now. I think I bought it for around 830000 The basement will be a second unit that will be just as big as the main house. And then there's a sunroom in the back with another like workshop yeah. that I'm going to turn into a third unit. Bam. So like you're getting three three different units of rent. I could either do traditional or I could rent it out to like traveling nurses. You put yeah. it on something like Furnish Finder. So then your rent's going to go up there too. It's going to cash flow significantly, but that's a deal a house hacker could have bought. That's the reason I'm bringing it up as an example. It's funny because yeah. when I first came to America, I didn't have the funds to really buy property. But I looked at house hacking. Grim Stefan had a video. Big Box had a video as well. And I was making like 15 bucks an hour at a set company, right? But I worked overtime for the full year. I didn't go out. I didn't do much. So the money I saved up from work overtime, I had about like 15 to like 16K saved up. And I got an FHA loan, lived in one unit, spot for triplex, and I became my property. And like you said before, you could add to it and prove to it and then rent out the other units. Yeah. So is it cash flowing now? Yeah. So you, you can almost live for free or close to free if you do something like that. Yeah. Three or four years later, that's going to have over six figures of equity. You pull that out, you could buy your next two to three houses off of the first house that you bought. So and two it, units were rented out. I lived in the middle one. I didn't pay any rent. There you go. So and how much money did you save? What would what would your rent have been? So it's funny. Like my job, right? I was still working overtime. I didn't start doing overtime at all. And all the money I used to spend for rent was just like 1200 bucks. Mm -hmm. I saved there you go. Yeah. So you're now saving like $14,000 a year, 15. That's another house next year. That's another FHA loan. Your house bought your next house. You do that 10 years in a row. You bought one house, every house paid for the next house. You have 10 homes with significant equity. You become a millionaire just letting inflation do its thing if you just get started with the right deal. Well, I made some bad choices, but yeah. <laughs> but that's stupid. That's what happened, yeah. and, and I will say this real quick too because everyone talks about inflation, inflation, inflation. Inflation is actually fantastic for real estate, assuming you're buying homes off of leverage. Can you break that down real quick for the people, uh, Dave, yes. as far as like how inflation helps you with real estate? That's a great question. The first thing is, in general, your your costs stay the same. You lock in a mortgage and whatever yeah, it was, years. was the mortgage on your triplex? Uh, the actual interest rate. Up? Oh, 3.5%. No, what was it every month? What did you pay? Uh, Total was 3,100. Okay, and let's say that every unit is going to rent for like $1,000 a unit. It's probably more, but let's just say It was that, like 14. Right? Okay, so we'll round it up to 1,500. So you're bringing in $4,500 of income mm. to spend three grand yeah. every month. 
that rent is going to go up every single year because of inflation. So 4,500 becomes 5,000, becomes 5,500, becomes 6,200. It ends up at $15,000 in the future. Right. You're still only paying $3,000 a month to own that house. Bam. And eventually it's completely paid off, right? Think about what rents were 30 years ago in Miami. Yeah. <laughs> right. We always look $200 or some shit, 500 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Max. Maybe yeah. for the nicest spot you could get into. Okay. So, yeah. Your payment stays locked in, but your income, your revenue continues to increase. Mm. The same thing happens to the value of the property in general. It goes up, it goes down, but it always ends up going up because we just keep printing money. That's what America does. That's actually what every country does. Ray Dalio, ha Ray Dalio has a really good video. Yeah, <clears throat> I think it's called the something about the changing world order where he talks about how every country just prints their currency into nothing. That's why no currencies have ever existed for a significant period of time. Wow. They all have worked their way into nothing, which is why guys like Michael Saylor are really into Bitcoin because mm -hmm. it's something you can't really inflate that. Not about Bitcoin though. If you buy a house, let's say you buy a $500,000 property, you put a hundred thousand dollars down. Okay. So you owe 400,000, you put a hundred thousand into it. Let's say that property goes up by 10%. 500 became 550. So you've gained $50,000 in equity, but you only put in $100,000 to buy that house. Okay, That's a 50% ROI, even though the asset only went up by 10%. Mm. Right? That's you like, guys just hear what he just said? Sheesh. Did you guys just hear what he just said? <laughs> Can you, one more time for the people, because people don't understand this when I try to tell them that inflation is your friend when you're a real estate investor, when you're buying on leverage. I would say not only is inflation your friend, like you, if you don't own real estate, you're just going to drown. Inflation yeah. is going to drown you. It's your yeah. only option. Right? Absolutely. So the math works out <clears throat> where you buy a Listen, house guys. for half a million dollars. You put 100000 down. That's uh, 20%. This works even better if you only put 5%. Yeah. Down, right? Yeah. But let's say you put 20% down. That's $100,000. The asset goes up by 10%, maybe over a two-year period of time. So now yep. it's worth five fifty. dollars Yep. Okay? You gain 50000 in equity, but you only put $100,000 down. That's a 50% return on your money on your cash that you put in guys exactly. which is incredible now you do that times 10 houses Kaching. yeah you're on your way to being a millionaire and real estate's what's going to take you there wow. that's what made me a millionaire was real estate you know what i mean guys like i like i didn't even realize it until after i i like looked at my stuff i was like oh well, shit the, the millionaire net worth and it was like but 90 percent plus of millionaires guys make their millions from real estate, man, because between the tax benefits, the appreciation, the cash flow that you're enjoying while you're while you're uh, you know you control the property. The key is to control the property with the least money down. That's the key. Yep. You know, um, obviously it's good. the deal's got to make sense or whatever. But the less money you put down, the better inflation works in your favor. Because remember, guys, the bank is giving you the majority of the money. You're not putting your own money now. If you had put, let's say, you put the five hundred thousand dollars of your own cash. Oh God, yeah, it ain't going to be you're as nice. You're only getting a ten percent return. Now. You're only getting a ten percent yep. return. So that's the beauty of real estate is that you can use other people's money, guys, to control an asset that's going to inevitably appreciate, right? Even in the worst of times, it's going to still, even with the with the crash that happened in 2008, it went down, but then the, the properties went back up. And I don't foresee for other people out there, oh, we're going to have a real estate crash like 2008. I don't foresee that happening. And you tell me what you think, Dave, because it's much harder to lend now. You know what I mean? You can't get a loan like for just having a pulse like back in 2008. And if you're cash flowing, who really cares? Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. So like what, what you're doing, Myron, is you are borrowing money from this party here yep. to buy this asset. And then this tenant is paying back the person you borrowed the money from and you get to keep all the difference. Yep. The only thing you're putting into this whole thing is whatever your down payment is and your time. Yeah. If you have to do a little bit of managing, right? Yeah. I don't know another asset that lets me take money from this person, buy this thing, and then take money from this person to pay back the person that I borrowed the money from. <laughs> and it gets better every <laughs> single year. Yeah. Every yeah. year it gets way better. So like the property and the that tax I buy, benefits. Yeah, we haven't even got into that, right? That's we'll talk about depreciation. It's cost segment. Absolutely. Next. The the property I bought, I bought one in Manteca, California. It was a fourplex, my first multifamily. When I bought it, the rents were seven hundred dollars a month. Mm. This was in twenty thirteen. I immediately bumped the rents up to 800 and thought I was a G because I was making an extra 400 bucks a month. Top G. Thing, right? <laughs> yeah. That is now renting for 1950 a month for every year. Wow. And you, and you still have it. Yeah. You still control the price. I still have it, but I, I, I didn't do anything to uh, my own merit. Not to mention you probably, you've had it now for nine years. What's it, what did you buy it for and what's it worth now? I bought it for two fifty. It's worth about seven fifty now. That's one of the ones that I did the cash out. That's when he did the cash out refund. I pulled that out, and that's going to buy my next three or four properties, and they're all going to do the same thing as that one did over an eight year period. Was it paid? Was it paid off or no? 
It wasn't paid off. Just paid down a little bit, but the equity went up so much that yeah, I, that you were able, were you able to just pay back the loan and own it outright, or do you no, say no? Nah, I that. took another loan on it. I borrowed more money against it. Okay, to yeah. buy more real estate. Yeah, 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 But it wasn't risky because the rents had like more than doubled. I had yeah. way more income coming in to pay off the the new higher loan. So you did, you, took, you took out the cash because you bought it for two fifty. Home appreciates to seven fifty. Take the cash out refi because some people would have said like, oh well, you could have just paid back the the loan and, and owned it, but no, fuck that. You already control the asset, right? Yeah. So I can, buy I can more either properties. Pay it off, and I could have saved maybe twenty five hundred bucks a month. That's what it would have saved me if I paid it off. Yeah. Or I could go buy ten more properties with that money, and that the same that they're going to do the same thing that that one did. Right? This so is like, where debt is good, guys. Yes. See, notice how he did not take that money to go pay his debt back. He said, no, fuck that. I'm going to go get more debt. And I didn't take that money to go buy a Lamborghini or a bunch of jewelry. No offense, Fresh. <laughs> <laughs> Anything what? else, right? Oh, my ass, bro. <laughs> Come on, man. I got to live a little bit, bro. I live a little bit, man. Tom, you got to live a little bit, all right? <laughs> no, go ahead. Sorry. So you, you took it to buy more houses, right? <laughs> yeah. So, like, the goal is that if you if you take the money that you earn and you buy things with it, you will never have money. If you take the money that you earn and you buy real estate, with it and then you take the money from the real estate to buy your things you will never run out of money mm -hmm. there you go so it's just it's just that delayed gratification and understanding that real estate is just in my experience the safest asset that you can scale at to the degrees that we talk about safely hey man i delayed five years i'm gonna have some fun now, okay <laughs> okay uh any any chats real quick chris or yeah, what's up? And yo, guys, do me do me a favor. Go ahead and like the video because we're giving you guys a Fire lot content, of guys. sauce right now when it comes to real estate. Who else is going to give you guys three episodes in one day? Uh, Darnell Elliott goes 50 bucks. Uh, I live close to Snobsdale. Do you have <laughs> issues with your neighbors due to your Airbnb? Scottsdale residents like calling police on their Airbnb neighbors. Have you had problems with Scottsdale? They're all stuck up snobs. <laughs> he, this is a good question. Um and I should probably clarify, when we talk about investing in real estate, it's part art and it's part science. We're we've mostly talked about the science element, the numbers, how to make it work for you. Mm -hmm. There's an art element to it also. So this property that, that I bought in Scottsdale sits on five acres. The nearest neighbor is very far away. You, you would have no idea what they're doing. If I did get a bad tenant that threw a big party, no one would ever know. It's a, it's mm. out in like one of the most exclusive areas in all of Scottsdale, probably the nicest area, wow. so, Silverleaf. So I, you think ahead when you're doing this. You don't buy a property with a neighbor that's like you're looking out the window right at those people. Hey, Timmy, there's yeah. some noise over there. Call the police. So question. So I, I'm sure we probably got a bunch of the viewers right now excited. They're like, well, real estate, this is fucking awesome, but I don't have that much money. Or I'm working towards getting a property. For people out there that might not have as much capital, what are some options? We talked about house hacking, yeah. FHA loans. What are some other options for people to be able to get their first property? House hacking is your best bet. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I still to this day house hack. Like That's how mm. amazing it is, right? I can, okay. You can get into the best neighborhoods, and it's like the easiest way to do it because you can borrow 97.5% of the yeah. cost of the asset, right? Wait, yeah. I, I thought there was a limit like four times you could do an FHA loan, no? Uh, you can only have one FHA loan at a time. So you have to refinance out of that FHA loan or sell the house. But so it's unlimited? It's No, it's not unlimited. So with primary residence loans that come through government-sponsored enterprises like Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, yeah. once you get four, it's harder to get more, but they, mm. they limit you at 10. Mm. So once you have 10 um, homes, you, you can't get a Fannie Mae or a Freddie Mac loan anymore. Got it. But we have a lot of other loan products that I use now that we just, you don't have to do that anymore. So you can house hack up to 10 houses. But you can't use 10 Sheesh. FHA loans. <clears throat> you mm. can get a 5% down conventional loan for if you want to keep the first FHA loan. Wow. Bam. And guys, again, the house hacking is you basically put 35 to 5% down. You get into the property. You live in it. Make it work for a year. And then you're able to get the hell out of that house. Rent it out. Preferably, you want to do this with a duplex or a triplex. You have another tenant paying you, right? So that you can basically live either for free or maybe even a little bit of cash flow. Yeah. Um, or even, a, I, I would say, even if you go a little bit negative, but you're, but you're, um, uh, but you're like, you have a tenant in there. Mortgage yeah. is being Make paid. It, mortgage is being paid at least. You leave the leave the property for a year. Uh, well, you live in it for a year. Leave and then bam, now you're going to profit because whoever Circle. takes your spot is going to be able to rent it out. So, um, so house hacking is the best way to do it. You what can partner with someone else. So let's say you have ten thousand dollars, they have thirty thousand dollars, but you have a little bit of experience with managing property, or you're a little bit better at knowing the market. You go to someone else who was going to buy a house, and you say, "Look, I'll put in ten thousand dollars. I'll take twenty five percent of the equity in the deal. Yeah. We'll split up the cash flow, and you would give me twenty five percent of it. However, that works out. So you can buy a house with another person. That's mm -hmm. another way that you can get into it. Because if you're super into real estate, you you like this stuff. You have the education. There's some value in that. There's a lot of people that don't don't want know to, shit. Yeah, exactly.
Wholesaling is another way where basically, can you br break it down what wholesaling is for the people real fast? Yeah, wholesaling would be, it's essentially selling the contract to buy yeah. a house. So like that one I told you about that I got under contract for a million fifty and he was listed at 1.5. Yeah. Let's say that it was going to praise at 1.3 or something like that. Yeah. I could sell you the right to buy that house at a million fifty mm -hmm. and you give me a hundred grand. So you're essentially getting the house for 1.15, but it's worth 1.3. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's about going out there and finding a deal, getting it locked up, putting it under a legally binding contract and then selling that contract to somebody else so that they can actually go close on the house Bam. Bam. yeah and that's another that's a great way to get your foot in the door when you don't have that much capital is you know you do a couple of those contracts make a, a little bit of money and then you'll be able to go ahead and get, take your, that, own. get your own um and then we talked about the burr method which is you know buy rehab refinance repeat can you tell us from your opinion what are the three biggest mistakes people make when buying real estate oh, maybe for the first fantastic, time yeah they're experts what mistakes do they make when buying real estate. First thing is people look at real estate like it's an asset like stocks. Mm. Buy low, sell high. Big mistake. Yeah. The, the, Agreed. What, what makes other investment vehicles risky is the fact that you have one exit strategy. You have to sell it for more than you paid for. Yeah. When you're looking at real estate, buying low and selling high is icing on the cake. But the fundamentals, what you really want to look for is does it generate more income every month than what it costs to own it? So the first Bam. mistake people make is what we call speculation. So I'm going to buy a house. It's going to go up by hundred, two hundred thousand dollars. I'm just going to sell it. It's easy, and they they don't realize that they're bleeding money every month, and they can't do that forever. Not a lot of people make that mistake like they used to. That was a really big problem in 2000 through 2006. Yeah. Another mistake that I think people make is they do not set aside enough in reserves. Mm. It, it, it's it things can happen. You're going to have at some point, like you play sports long enough, you're going to get injured. You buy real estate long enough, something's going to break that you didn't see coming. You have to have more money set aside in reserves than what you probably think. So to me, if you're going to be a real estate investor, it pairs very well with a frugal lifestyle. Like you said, Scott Trench, CEO of Bigger Pockets, wrote the book Set for Life. That's a big piece of that book. Is mm -hmm. like, look, this is why you want to control and delay gratification because it allows you to put your money into something that's going to grow over time without actually worrying about losing it. The third thing is I'll say... People make emotional decisions. They buy the pretty house. They buy the house they would want to live in. They, they buy the house that they get excited by. Stupid. Not necessarily because it's an investment. Damn. So well question for you, because you mentioned, we, we talked about reserves a little bit on this pod. Can you break down for the people what reserves are and how much should they have? Roughly, yeah. Yeah, so the reserves are just the money that you keep set aside that you don't spend. Just like if you're a Dave Ramsey follower, this would be like your emergency fund, right? But if you own real estate, that emergency fund needs to grow significantly with the more that you're buying because you are on the hook to make these payments for different properties. So you asked me a little earlier, are you worried that people aren't going to travel? Yeah, I, I have to be aware of that, right? So if I take every property and I put six to 12 months of the payment and I set it aside for every single deal, if travel slows down and I was expecting to make 10 grand a month and I only make seven grand a month, so I'm three grand short. Even if the cash flow isn't quite there, I've got a lot of money set aside. With real estate, the simplest answer is you make money by having a lot of time, by waiting. And if you want to wait, you have to have money set aside to weather whatever storms are going to come. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really that simple. If you, How do you make money in real estate? Well, you, you buy right and you make sure it cash flows. But really, all of that is dwarfed by just waiting and letting inflation do its thing. <laughs> yeah. No. Just, just don't true. lose it. That's it. Just don't, yeah, just don't let the property go to foreclosure. So there's another thing that I uh, that I noticed about real estate that uh, it was like a little epiphany I had when I was in law enforcement, I was be I was going through training to become a defensive tactics instructor, and the guy okay. that was teaching me, we were talking about firearm safety. So there's there's four rules about firearm safety, right? Never always treat a gun like it's loaded. Never point at something that you're not willing to destroy. Uh, keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to shoot, and then know your backdrop and beyond. Yeah. And what he said something that it was very simple, but it was nostalgia profound. just now for me. By the way, yes. hearing that it's like drilled into our yeah, brains. It's right? like burned in my head. He said. David, you can make one mistake. You can violate one of these rules and you'll be okay. So if you put your finger on the trigger and you're startled and you accidentally squeeze it, but your gun was pointed at a safe place, you'll be all right. If you always treat the gun like it's loaded, even if you didn't know what was beyond the backdrop, you're not going to ever actually put your finger on the trigger. Okay. There you go. Mistakes happen when two of those rules get violated. Ah. And it's the same way with real estate. If you're going to lose a house, two things have to go wrong. The property has to be worth less than what you owe, so you can't sell it, and you have to have run out of money to make the payment. Bam. So if it cash flows and or you have money in reserves, that never happens where you can't make the payment. And then you don't have to worry about is the market going up or down or how much equity do I have, right? It's just, When I saw that that is what the only way I lose is both of those things have to go wrong, and I have complete control over the money that I keep in reserves. That's why I keep working. It's why I didn't just buy a bunch of real estate and retire. 
you don't know like when that black swan event might might happen so yeah. the more money i put aside the bigger buffer i have the more confidence i have to go take bigger swings and the bigger swings you take eventually the bigger targets you hit and that's how you build wealth Bam. Well, well so, said, man. so question for you here so uh what is um i guess a target that people should aim uh to have in reserves per property i would say six, six months reserves per property minimum okay okay so let's say a house costs you ten thousand dollars a year to 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 basically for, to handle all the debts right all the mortgage everything you should tax have sixty thousand dollars set aside you should have house. sixty thousand dollars in so, okay yeah. yeah all right That's ideally fair. now now you may be a person that saves money really well like what if you save six grand every single month that person maybe doesn't need to save sixty thousand dollars versus the person who lives paycheck to paycheck they're working at 7-Eleven and they just barely got that house at all and they don't have the ability to go work overtime like I did, they definitely need to have the $60,000. Okay. Mm. That's that's a good idea. I mean, that's a lot, but that's a really good rule of thumb. You ain't going to go six months, you know, and that that will definitely deal with vacancy. That'll deal with, and you know, if you have a couple of properties, you can use money from one. So, okay. Yes. That makes yep. sense. Okay. Um, Taxes. Hmm. Let's talk about, should I hit the chats real quick, Chris, or... Okay, calling in uh, calling in the air support on the FHA question from David's lending partner. You can have one <laughs> FHA loan at a time, and you can buy one primary residence per year. There's an actual limit on uh, primary residences. The 10 loans max is to, uh, to keep buying investment properties. This okay. is my partner in the one brokerage, Christian. Oh, and Christian. he is a uh, detailed Debbie. So <laughs> okay. I said you can only get 10 primary residences, and he's clarifying that. Yeah, Thank you, you know Christian. what? I think he's right, dude, because um, I was using U.S. Bank to buy loans, and I, I'm almost certain they told me I can yeah. do up to 10 loans with them. So If it's he's, a primary residence, the money. you can keep buying. Yeah, for because because for my investment property, yeah, I can do 10 loans with them. So you're, you I go. think he's correct. For sure. Uh, thank you so much for that, by the way, Christian. Uh, Matthew Hatcher, 50 bucks. Money Mondays have seriously become an amazing source of information to navigate the modern market on so many levels. This is value. Seriously, well done, gentlemen. Yeah, what other podcast is going to help you guys make money, get in shape, not be a fucking loser, Listen. help you guys get girls and give you entertainment? You Nowhere got, else. You got the RP for dating and finance. Yeah. You can't lose, bro. You know, we got a legend in the house, David Green, man, part of a ha one half of Big Well, you pretty much run bigger pockets now. now. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, man, we're happy to have you. So, uh, taxes. taxes. Let's yeah. talk about depreciation and the magical term cost segregation. Okay. So the first thing that you got to clarify, people get confused. The word depreciation is confusing. It is. It sounds like the value of the asset is going down. Yeah. This is not what we're talking about. It's not the opposite of appreciation. Depreciation is a tax term that refers to the fact that in a business, if you buy a material for it, you can expect that whatever you bought will fall apart over time. Wear and tear, baby. Wear and tear. That's the best way to look at it. So if you own a landscaping business and you bought a truck, that truck is not going to last forever. It's going to wear down. If you have a restaurant, you buy a dishwasher, it's only going to last for what they call the useful life. Let's say a dishwasher lasts for 10 years. Okay. If you bought a house for $500,000 and the, cause the government's going to let you d uh, take a write off for the wear and tear, the houses fall apart over yeah, time. Of course. Right? If you just, if they let you take the whole amount right off the bat, you would just buy a house every year, right off $500,000 and never pay taxes. So it doesn't work quite like that. What yeah. they do is they say over 27 and a half years for this residential property, you can take one 27 and a half of that amount and discount it against the income. Yeah. So I'd have to pull my calculator, do some math. But so here, I'll get mine right now. So, so let's say like, we buy a $100,000 house, guys. Okay. There you go. Divided so by 27 and a half. So 100,000. Right, divided by 27.5, that equals $3,636. So let's say that the property made $4,000 that year, mm -hmm. right? You could take that amount off of what you made. And what's the difference there? $363. That's all you're going to pay taxes on. Bam. Real estate's <laughs> awesome, right? You it's, only pay three hundred three hundred $363 on for that. That's what you're going to pay tax profit. on, guys. So you're going to pay like 15% of that or whatever. Yeah, right? which is so, nothing. So yeah. real estate shelters its own mm -hmm. income. That's one of the benefits, but it gets even better, okay? If you are a real estate professional, you are allowed to take the income, the depreciation from that asset and mm -hmm. use it against income you made in other ways. So I can go <laughs> buy a, a big property and I have more depreciation than the income. And then I can use that depreciation against real estate commissions, against loan commissions, against other things that I'm doing in the world of real estate. Yeah. So now that I get tax sheltered. Yep. Now you have the bonus depreciation. This is where it becomes like super awesome. And before you tell them about the bonus depreciation, just so you guys understand, when you become a real estate professional, okay? For example, my accountant made me a real estate professional. So I was able to offset my the money I made from my fitness business, the podcast, um, consultations, whatever it may be. I was able to offset that money, right, from my real estate, from the money I made from the podcast because I'm deemed as a real estate professional. So outside income can now also 
be used. Uh, it can also be, I guess, how do I say this? Mitigated yep. through the real estate. So I want to make that very clear for them. So if you're a real estate professional, but you have other jobs or other uh, methods of income, it's a fantastic way to mitigate your your tax liability. That's exactly right. Now, here's where you take that and you supercharge it. Yep. This is scary stuff right here. Rather than just taking the depreciation over 27 and a half years, mm -hmm. they will let you do what's called a cost segregation study where you look at a house and you say, well, I'm allowed to take the whole thing over 27 and a half years. But honestly, that dishwasher is not going to last 27 and a half years. That electrical wiring is not going to last that long. The HVAC unit's not. The roof's not going to last that long. Mm. They will let you speed up the period of time that you depreciate individual parts of that actual property. The bathroom's not going to last that long. So you can get a cost segregation study does. It says this thing's only going to last five years. This thing's only going to last three years. This is only going to last six years. And they basically let you front load it, right? <laughs> Take it all in the very beginning and not wait all the way until the end. And they do that based on the total value of the asset. So they take like the price you pay, they subtract the land value and whatever the actual structure is or the improvements as well. Yeah. So Which is typically 20. So let's say a house is a hundred thousand. Like the house is a hundred thousand dollars. You got about 80,000 that That's you can right. use because they're, they're going to take out about 20% for the, for the land. land in general. Right. Yeah. So I bought a triple net property in uh, Minnesota last year. What's a triple net property. That would be a property where like the tenants pay everything. They pay their own taxes. Oh. They pay their own uh, insurance. They pay for everything and are they renting it to own or no? Nope, not okay. at all. This is what's awesome about triple net properties, right? right? So I get a, a rent payment from them and then I also charge them for all the other costs associated with that. <laughs> wow. Right. So this thing was 15 million, 16 million dollars or something like that. So I did a cost segregation study on that, and I don't know exactly how the math worked out. My my CPA handled the details. Yeah. But let's say they come back and say, okay, if you do a cost segregation study on this 15 million dollar property, you can basically write off three million dollars or four million dollars of income from this thing sheesh now i'm a real estate professional right so that one property is going to cover the first three to four million dollars of income that i made for that year bam right so if i would have because the high tax brackets maybe that's going to actually cost me like two million dollars in taxes yeah well I, let's say i put three million dollars down to buy the 15 million dollar property yep but it saved me two million dollars in taxes that's like only putting a million dollars down yep to get a 15 million dollar property my roi would triple Yep. Because the amount of money that I put in was decreased by that much. Yep. Okay. So when you hear Robert Kiyosaki and Donald Trump saying, I don't pay money in taxes, it's not a scam. They are using depreciation, right? Yes. So the, it, there's a downside to it. There's a little bit of risk. You have to deploy your capital. You can't go spend it on yachts. Like yeah. you have to put it back into real estate. You have to. You can lose that money if you invest in real estate. That's yep. another thing you have to think about, right? So I don't, there's a lot of people that get angry at people who don't pay taxes because they're, they're buying this real estate, right? It's not like it comes just for free. Mm -hmm. There's a price you pay, but Sacrifice. if you're yeah, but if you're good at doing this, this is how you avoid paying taxes. And the best thing is it forces you to keep buying real estate, forces you to put your money back into something, reinvest it, let it keep growing. Wow. And I'll tell you this, I'll never forget this when Donald Trump was debating Hillary. One of the things she said is he doesn't pay taxes, he just doesn't pay taxes, blah, blah, blah. And he said, Yeah, that's because I'm smart. <laughs> and I was like, fuck yeah, you know, that's why that's why Trump is where he is, man. Like I told you guys all the time, I tell you this on the podcast. If you're able to own real estate, and or create jobs. These are the cornerstone of the American market, okay? That's yeah, Amazon. Sm small businesses too. are literally the backbone of the United States. So if you're able to do these two things, own real estate, provide housing, and or own a small business and employ people, you're going to get enormous tax benefits. And depreciation is the tool that real estate investors use to save a bunch of money on taxes. Then you add uh, the, you know, the, uh, cost segregation where you're basically instead of depreciating over 27 and a half years, you're depreciating over five years. Well, fuck man, you're going to be able to save a whole shit ton of money guys. And guys, most people that go through life don't know how to do this or even have an idea how to do this. They don't all. even know what depreciation is. They're like, wait, what? Losing value. No, it's so, the wear and tear on the house. You got a gem here, guys. You can use for yourself and your family. So there you go. Shout I didn't to David know Green. about this. I, this. My first time ever doing this was maybe a year or two ago. I went cost my seg? whole time. Yeah. Damn. I actually learned it. I learned cost seg from you guys. Um, You guys had that guy. Um. I forget his name, Jewish guy. He was there in the full garb. He was on bigger Jonas. pockets. Jonas, yes. Yeah, shout out to him, man. I learned cost segregation from him and I was like, holy shit. And that like just changed my mindset on everything as far as like, yeah. The more you know, like, you can apply it better. Yeah, dude, because you get depreciation 27 and a half years. Then you get cost seg, which is non structural, you know, property, you know, stuff on the property, like you said, with the bathroom, paint, walls, all that other stuff. And dude, you, this is how you seriously save money in real estate. Uh, Matthew Hatcher, Money Mondays have seriously become an amazing source of information to navigate that. Oh, no, read that one. And then uh, I think we're caught up. Yep. Cool. Um, All right. What else? Uh, okay. So we covered taxes, 
uh, house hacking, finding deals. What are your thoughts on find, how, how should people go about finding deals? You guys are good at this, by the way. You should be professional podcasters. Is, <laughs> yeah, I think you're milking more info out of me in a, the shortest period of time than ever has been done on an interview. <laughs> ever. Like, well, we're on a time frame, so <laughs> no, we're gonna we're gonna bring you back, bro. Like yeah, I said, sure. I, I love these discussions. I think um, I, I'm trying to get as many guys that watch our podcast to you know to you know get into real estate, get into crypto, get into everything, man. Yeah. Um, because you want to be able to be diversified and know what the fuck is going on, and and real estate is the best way to shelter your taxes. Man. And if we don't know, we bring the experts. Exactly. Yeah. With someone know. like Dave, who's a. I mean, wh- how many deals do you have under contract right now? All right, I've I've closed about fifteen houses in the last thirty days, and I just added up that the equity at closing on those deals it was over a million dollars on like day one equity so if you looked at what they appraised for versus what i paid how many doors do you have in total i, see, I don't really measure the doors because not okay. many of them are multifamily okay right? okay okay so it, it would probably be, sound better if i told you the total value of the assets but yeah. it's probably right around like at this point because i just sold a lot of like those those burr houses i told you about okay yeah i sold early those on in, in the and, game yeah so i sold like a two hundred fifty thousand dollar house replaced with a million dollar house mm. right mm. but i bought less actual houses than than where there was before so, so what's okay. your portfolio worth then i guess instead of saying uh, counting roughly, doors and roughly, stuff roughly, roughly you don't have to say yeah, yeah. that's a good question actually i know that the equity in it is probably going to be around 15 million or so wow but the actual value of the it equity. would be much yeah the Damn. equity alone 15 mil that's not even like a, if, if you got equity 15 Dude, your the total portfolio is probably fifty million, if so not more. Is yeah, it to say that yeah. you're set for life? <laughs> Shout out Scott Trench, very nice. Scott fresh. Trench, bro. I like that. There so you go. Uh, when, fresh, it, when it comes jokes. to finding deals, I'm actually going to be putting a retreat together in Scottsdale at that house I told you about. They okay. can go to davidgreen24.com slash retreat if they want to sign up for that. Let's we, put that let's make sure we get that oh, link in there. You. David Green twenty four at uh twenty four dot com slash retreat. Okay. Is Fresh and Fit welcome? Oh yeah. You guys are be awesome to have you. you're just gonna like that house man it's like the coolest house i've ever seen it yeah. we're throwing a party though excuse we're throwing a party <laughs> i know your guys' party is about to see if i can handle that <laughs> um but the uh the point of it is to teach people like literally at the houses that i just bought yeah. how i bought them what i looked for how i negotiated so there's mm. like a lot of information that's in there the first thing anybody who's serious about this that wants to be good at real estate investing needs to look for is days on market it is the most important mm. metric no one talks about it. I mean, it's like it's the equivalent of jujitsu in MMA. Like you're not gonna do this well if you don't have jujitsu. Yeah. Even in cars, bro. How long has cars been sitting on a lot? You can negotiate because guess what? The motivated seller. You know what? Damn, this mirror for so long. I'll, I'll just take whatever that's, I can that's get. Probably one of the strongest negotiating tools because that's when you see blood in the water. If it's been on the market for 30 days, Oof. you could be a little bit more aggressive. 60 days, man, you might as well bully that fucking buyer. So yeah, here's you know? the example I give. Let's oh, please, say that you're uh, you're a really pretty girl in your high school. And and prom's coming up. All right. Yeah. This is specifically custom made for you guys. Yeah. And you're thinking like, I want to go to prom, but you're also thinking I want to go with the best guy I can. Yep. Right. So you're kind of holding out for the high school quarterback. Yeah. And yeah. then and then he's not asking you. And prom's getting closer and closer. You're like, well, maybe I'll take the guy on the baseball team. Yeah. And then you're not getting asked again. You're like, okay, I just want to take a guy. All right. And, and nothing's coming up. And now you're starting to get desperate. Like, is anyone going to take me to prom? The chess okay. master comes up. <laughs> exactly and then maybe the chess master goes with someone else if it's the day before prom starts it doesn't matter who the person is she's gonna say yes because just going to prom is more important than staying home Facts. okay that is i use that example because it, it describes the psychology of someone selling their house mm. when you first put it on the market you're expecting 10 offers no contingencies all cash four hundred thousand dollars over asking price <laughs> you want that high school quarterback buyer and the longer it sits the more these scales start to shift nope and I know this from selling houses and working with sellers towards it goes from I want all this. I want a fair price. I just want to get it sold. Is anyone going to buy my house? Oh, my God. I'm never going to move on with my life. Right. Yeah. That's the psychological <laughs> target when you're trying to get deals that you're looking for. Right. And and you can't really feel bad about that because the seller's not going to feel bad when you're the person coming in and there's 10 other offers. And and they're trying to get as oh, much yeah. as they can for the house. Yeah. The facts. Way, oh, dude, yeah. That's awesome. Seller. Yeah, man. I'd be wanting to hit them with a Hadouken or a fucking. <gasps> Whenever they fucking try to scam, oh yeah, we're good. Uh, I got an offer right now, fifty k over asking cash. Fuck you. Which and I already do. know it's a New Yorker buyer, a New York buyer, man. So it's like fuck. Yeah, that's so, it. So you look for those houses that have been set on the market a long time, and then the other thing I'll say is, uh, it used to be write an offer and try to get it accepted. Not anymore. In this market, offers are jabs. You don't throw a jab to knock someone out. 
you throw a jab to see how do they respond. Mm. You're feeling that person out, right? Like, you know, in the law enforcement community, when you first make contact with somebody, I'm looking to see when I contact you, how do you respond to me? Yeah. Right. There's a baseline that I'm expecting. And if you deviate from that, that's going to tell me way more about you than the actual words that you're going to say. Absolutely. So you throw an offer out there that's really aggressive. And if they just completely ignore you, there's probably nothing there. Mm-hmm. Let's say they counter you and they counter you way less than their asking price. They're showing motivation right off the bat. Bam. Bam. Let's say the listing agent returns your call the second it comes in. They're like, hey, well, let's put a deal together. That tells me a lot. Their listing is about to expire. They're going to be advocating for me to their client because they just want to get the house sold at all. Yep. Their emotions are going to tell me way more about the psychology of the seller than whatever their offer actually yeah. says, right? So when you're seeing houses that sit on the market for high days on market, you can play these games. You can read people like this. You can look for these great deals. Don't even bother doing this on a house that hit the market three days ago. That's the hot home on Zillow that everybody's looking yeah, for. Right. And so a lot of people get frustrated with real estate because they say, oh, they're not willing to negotiate. I couldn't get any. And I'm, well, show me the houses that you're looking at. Why would you go for that house, right? Yeah. That's like the prettiest girl in the school and yeah. mom's still six months away. And you're like, surprised that she said no. <laughs> No, it's true. That's a good I mean, and, and I and I can say from experience, like I'm that guy that I see that that you know that duplex, triplex, whatever it may be for three hundred, four hundred thousand, and is bringing in you know four k a month. And I'm like, oh yeah, let's do a one percent, yeah. And then it's like I go in there and there's a bunch of fucking assholes from you know the city. New York. Oh, yeah, I'm leaving. I'm leaving uh, New York where I'm trying to move to Connecticut, whatever, or here in Miami where you know got a bunch of people here that also want to buy the house cash, whatever. And then bam, you lose the deal. Those so, Canadians, the Chinese. <laughs> but I I like your strategy, man. You're buying these houses that are over a million dollars because. No one's going to compete with you. That's it. That's exactly There's right. no competition. Yeah. You know, so you can literally tell them, hey, this has been on the market for 30, 60 days. I want $500,000 off, which like normally people be like, what the fuck? Are you even able to do that? But you can do that because you have the money, you have the capital, and there's not many people that are going to buy, uh, you know, a 6,000, a 6,800 square foot home in Scottsdale thinking like, oh, whatever, that's going to be either a million, a multi-millionaire that's going to buy, that's going to try to live in, but not many savvy investors that are going to use Airbnb. And yourself. multi-millionaire investors aren't jumping on homes right now they're waiting to see what's going to happen with the economy there right so like the best example or the best picture i could paint would be if you look at one column as supply and another column as demand yep in a perfectly even world where there's a there's there's a buyer for every single house right let's say that average day on market is going to show up like 30 days right as supply gets higher than demand which is what we're seeing right now this gap right here is where your opportunity is Okay, the houses at the bottom of the price range, the most desirable ones that are still like down here, you're not going to get a good deal on those. There's still tons of buyers for those homes. Yeah. But as this starts to happen, the higher that you get, and, and it's usually price range, but it's basically just desirability of the house, the buyer pool starts to shrink. Right. Yeah. That's where you have leverage as a buyer. That's where you're the, the chess geek that actually has a chance with the pretty girl Bam. because there's nobody else that's out there. Bam. Right. Yeah. So don't get frustrated chasing after the same deal that everyone's chasing after and saying, oh, there's nothing out there. The market's too high. Real estate's a scam. Like that. That's the people that are in the comments that are complaining about it all the time. Stupid. They're looking at the wrong houses. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Any deal works if the numbers work. And, it, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes, I mean, that's innovative, man. I've never thought about looking like, you know, looking at those big ass deals. But, hey, man, there's no competition and you're able to kill it with Airbnb. So that's that's some genius stuff right there. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, any right. chats, Chris? No, we're good. Yo, guys, like the video, by the way. All right. Um, this subscribe to the channel. Here. Subscribe to Fresh Fit, obviously. And also subscribe to Bigger, Bigger Pockets. Pockets. And then you, you have your own YouTube channel as well, right? It's called David Green. Uh, David Green Real Estate. Yeah, yep. on on YouTube. But on Bigger YouTube. Pockets is the main one, right? Bigger Pockets is the company that I work for. I host their podcast. They they're the juggernaut in this space. If yeah. you want to learn about real estate investing, that's where you want to go. Their website, their forums, their blogs, the books they have, the podcast. They actually have five or six podcasts now. It's oh wow. Yeah, they got like a whole podcast network that's going on. I think they've covered like every topic for real estate possible you could think of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, you're and you're going to be here in Florida like fairly often, right? Because yep. you're investing here. We'll do yep. some more episodes. Yeah, we're gonna do we're gonna do some more episodes with Dave guys because um and i'm gonna actually um, now that i know that you have your own firm where you guys lend i'm gonna talk to you because i got that deal in texas i'm actually very interested in i'll, so, do, my, I'll do my refinance three probably absolutely we'll make sure we get connected on that. where can i find your brother uh, i'm on social media at david green 24 there's mm-hmm. an e at the end of green the youtube channel is the david green real estate you could go to the one brokerage.com and you can see uh, about our loan company there and then my website is just david green 24.com bam Bam. Check them out, guys. Um, and we're going to be back with some lovely ladies. It's 945 now. I'm thinking probably like what? Chris, uh, 1030. 1030. We'll start with We'll have the girls. Okay. And we have Richard Hart as well. Back with the girls as well. So it's going to yeah, be, be on the panel. Girls, right? so, Richard Hart. All right, man. Like the video, guys. We'll catch you guys back here in a little bit. Love you guys. Peace. Peace.